I am king of this wretched unraveled kingdom. But I see very little these days. Our king has watched over this land since ages long, long ago. The king had a dear queen, a woman of unparalleled beauty. His Highness, where has he gone? The queen has taken him. Seek adversity. Such is the calling of a true leader. Seek adversity and they will be yours. And your wishes granted. Seek strength. The rest will follow. Strength is displayed and personified in many different forms. It can be the strength of one's physical form, a testament to one's natural abilities, pushing themselves beyond the limit. Strength can be within one's own mind, the vital skill of observation and making careful judgments to learn and become something more. Strength is often represented by a crown or a title to mark one's deeds and accolades. However, these are merely a facade for most rulers. We often see the symbol of a crown as a God-given right or an heirloom passed throughout a lineage who are milking the fame of their ancestors long past. Yet there are a unique few that not only bear the weight of a crown, but have earned that very responsibility. This is the mark of a true leader, one who has earned the respect of its people through their deeds. This particular brand of strength is a rare occurrence, but does not go unnoticed by their subjects. In a life fraught with adversity, there are very few we can look to for inspiration. Learning more of the valor of these figures may very well serve our own ambitions and determination to press on despite the odds. These rulers, by will of strength and strength alone, represent what mere men are capable of. Perhaps we can reach the very same heights as them. Maybe the fire that fuels them burns within us as well. We only have to trust in our own strength and the rest will follow. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Elden Ring is Dark Souls 2 series. When looking at the theme of strength and what it entails, Dark Souls 2 and Elden Ring have very similar outlooks on the subject separate from the other titles. Strength and perseverance takes place in many different areas of both games with two prominent characters that embody these qualities which are Vendrick, ruler of Drangleic, and Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. Their fame and deeds and how they interact or represent themselves to the player are very similar in my view. It is often regarded that Elden Ring is Dark Souls 2 too as a common way of highlighting the game's similar ambitions and themes. So we are bringing the discussion to how both games similarly handle strength, perseverance, and the similar story beats of these two larger-than-life figures. King Vendrick was the king of Drangleic. This kingdom was built on the ruins of the previous kingdom where the four great ones once ruled. He was a promoter and master of strength of arms. Vendrick was known to favor basic swords and more physical means of combat as opposed to studies of sorcery or practices of faith. Our primary goal as bearer of the curse is to find him and seek the answers of the land and our curse. His presentation is one of great importance. Many other characters reference his deeds in a way that depicts him as an incredibly powerful ruler and warrior. Unlike a character like Gwyn, Vendrick is never depicted or revered in the same way as a god would be. Vendrick appears to be just a regular man who with his strength was able to accomplish many great things. According to Chancellor Welliger, he built the kingdom of Drang Lake after vanquishing the four great ones. Essentially, he was able to ascend to such power without the aid of magic, prophecy, or any outside influencers aside from his own combat abilities. His rule would turn sour as he was approached by Nashandra, a fragment of Manus, the father of the Abyss. 
Nishandra assumed the form of a beautiful woman who warned Vendrick of a threat across the sea. This threat would be the giants according to her warning. After taking Nishandra as his queen, Vendrick would pillage the land of the giants and return with an unknown prize. This very prize was used to create the golems that would build the Drang Lake Castle. This would be met with a time of peace with Vendrick and Nishandra ruling together as king and queen of Drang Lake. This time of peace was broken after the giants retaliated with the giant lord at the helm of their assault. This would lead to a war that would ravage the kingdom for generations. After the war and the defeat of the giants, the kingdom would be left in a ruined state, similar to how we find it as our journey begins as bearer of the curse. At the same time of the war, the undead curse would begin to take hold of Drang Lake's people, likely due to the fading of the first flame. Vendrick would begin to research the cure to the curse alongside his brother Aldia. While the simple solution would be to relight the first flame, Vendrick refused to do so and also refused the notion that letting the flame fade would be the appropriate approach as well. Vendrick sought a third option that was met with failure all while discovering that Nishandra, his queen, was a fragment of Manus. Vendrick would force himself into exile where we find him in the undead crypt, a now undead husk of his former self. Vendrick sought to protect himself and his soul from Nishandra so she could not use it to approach the throne of want. His hollow state is likely due to the separation of himself and his soul. In Elden Ring, there is a similar revered figure known as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. As the first Elden Lord, he ruled alongside Queen Merica over the lands between. Before assuming the status of royalty, Godfrey would be known as a fearsome warrior with the style of a typical depiction of a barbarian. He craved battle and knew nothing else according to the Godfrey icon description. To suppress his insatiable lust for aggression in combat, he would take on the lion Sirach. Sirach would essentially be fused to Godfrey as a sort of suppressor and advisor to him. Essentially, this partnership between the two turned Godfrey from a barbarian to a more royal, king-like figure. This was likely due to Merica's wishes for the representatives of the Golden Order and all the perfection that it stood for to have a certain atmosphere and divinity and properness. A barbarian would not make for the most pleasant representation for the Golden Order, so Sirach became the means by which Godfrey would quote-unquote calm down. Much like Vendrick, Godfrey was a master combatant with arms known for his large double battle axe fighting style. His prowess was admired by all, including some demigod children like Radon. Godfrey's time as lord would transform him from a savage to legend in the lands between. His tales would also be written on the various sword monuments scattered throughout the land, such as the one located near Castle Morn. Godfrey, much like Vendrick, would also go to war with the giants at the behest of his queen. He, with Merica's armies, would nearly wipe out the fire giants and confine their flame of ruin to the mountains where it has remained throughout the ages. According to the Elden Lord crown description, Godfrey would vanquish all enemies from the lands between, this victory would be met with the loss of his purpose and therefore he would lose his guidance of grace. The hue would essentially fade from his eyes. Godfrey's loss of grace alongside his fellow warriors would dub them as the first tarnished in the lands between. This resulted in his banishment from the lands by Queen Merica according to his speech Melina narrates for the player. Godfrey and his men would be exiled to wander where they resided eventually in the Badlands. He would return to his old ways under exile according to his remembrance description taking on the name Horalu. As Merica willed, Godfrey would perish in the Badlands after some time. When the Elden Ring was shattered, he would resurrect and return back to the lands between to assume his former title with the dialogue, Alas, I am returned, to be granted audience once more. Godfrey has returned by his right as the first Elden Lord when we meet him at the foot of the Erd Tree. Both of these great leaders and kings share a similar story. Both managed to play a large role in establishing a kingdom or order. Their means were very similar by using strength and arms over other forms of combat such as magic. 
They are physically depicted as traditional or typical warrior types, wielding large weapons and having a large physique. Unlike other embodiments of strength in the series, these two were not considered gods like figures such as Gwyn. They did not possess any divine qualities or inherit any sort of great otherworldly power. Godfrey and Vendrick were just simply very accomplished warriors by way of their own skill. They were able to fight their way to make a name for themselves, becoming legends in their respective stories. We hear countless tales of both figures as a means of showcasing their influence over their lands. Some even come to worship their deeds to an almost fanatic-like approach with characters like Godric. Vendrick was able to vanquish the Four Great Ones and build a kingdom upon their power, while Godfrey was able to establish power by eliminating every possible threat to the Golden Order and becoming the first Elden Lord. Both even met a similar betrayal by their respective queens. Vendrick would retreat to the Undead Crypt and halt Nishandra's dark plans, while Godfrey was banished to the Badlands after his Guidance of Grace had disappeared. They also had a withering of their familial relationships. Vendrick would lose his ties to his brother, and Godfrey would never see his children again, save for Morgoth, who he wistfully said his parting words to before we began our fight with him at the foot of the Erd Tree. As strong and larger than life as they may be, they are also still human with the loss of their family and relationships that makes their story even more tragic, considering they are depicted as morally good individuals by their people, a rare occurrence in both respective worlds. They didn't lose their way to hubris or greed, but rather were taken advantage of and used by their respective queens. While one might argue that Vendrick was not a morally good individual because of his assault on the giants, this attack was only probably due to Nishandra's warning. Perhaps the giants would have never attacked if no warning was given. What makes these two unique and similar to one another, more importantly, is how they embody the idea of strength and that influence on both the bearer of the curse and the tarnished. Both figures are essentially representations of what we will become by the end of both games. Vendrick bestows the crown of kingship upon us if we vanquish all lost kings and return their crowns to him. We essentially take his place as ruler of Drang Lake. As his dialogue states, he refers to us as the coveter of the throne. He understands what we want and how we plan to finish what he started in order to either continue an Age of Fire or usher in an Age of Dark or pursue alternative paths. Vendrick does not give us a clear answer but only asks us that we trust in strength and that the rest will follow. We as the new ruler of Drang Lake would have the strength to forge our own paths as we choose, much like Vendrick wanted to when looking to remove the undead curse from the land. Godfrey also represents our end goals as tarnished since he is the first Elden Lord. Becoming Elden Lord ourselves is our ultimate goal in order to shape the lands as we see fit, whether that's repairing Merica and becoming her consort or pursuing radical options outside that framework. Much like Vendrick, Godfrey knows what we want since we happen to share the same tarnished affliction as him. We both seek audience with Merica in order to usher in the age of our choosing and repair the lands. We have vanquished all foes much like Godfrey did in order to get to this point of our meeting him at the foot of the Erd Tree. We are answering the same summons by the guidance of Grace. This is further reinforced by the quote from Melina stating Merica's words, quote, then, after thy death, I will give back what I once claimed, return to the lands between, wage war, and brandish the Elden Ring, grow strong in the face of death, warriors of my lord, Lord Godfrey. Godfrey is simply following the guidance of grace, much like us. He is essentially the original Tarnished, something that many Tarnished like us admire and look up to. The adoration for him is even seen throughout the Round Table Hold, the Tarnished Headquarters. Many paintings depicting him can be found hung on the walls, as well as potentially his axe embedded in the Round Table itself. His final words, much like Vendrick, signal a passing of the torch to the player with, quote, Thy strength befits a crown. Godfrey is recognizing the abilities of the Tarnished and knows that they are worthy for the title since they have bested him in battle the only thing he has ever known. Both characters are ideal end goals for both players in many aspects. 
They represent what we could become, something that is not highlighted as heavily as other games in the series. In the case of DS1 and 3, we aren't becoming Gwyn, but rather fixing his mistake and selfishness or altering his original design in some way. There is no mantle or title to be upheld by our options with interacting with the first flame how we see fit. We as the player are not fixing the mistakes of Vendrick and Godfrey, but rather assuming a role similar to them to continue what they had started. Vendrick helps us to do what he could not when it comes to the decisions surrounding the throne and the curse, and Godfrey is content with either outcome of our fight with him so long as someone sets upon the Elden Throne, fulfilling the purpose of the Guidance of Grace. Their strength was something we admired and sought to attain ourselves throughout our journeys. They became the ideal role models for us in many ways. They experienced similar trials, hardship, and loss as we do. All of our skills were put to the test, and we all experienced loss of comrades and close ties, and we all took the mantle of responsibility to assume the role of lord or king of the respective lands. Strength in the case of both games is something that is attainable for us who might seem significantly weaker. We walk the same steps as them within our journey and inherit slash accomplish the same power as them. Strength is not a God-given quality, but rather earned by both figures. We inherit the ideals of strength that made them legendary. We become the next legend for the ages to admire. After taking a look at the concepts of strength and how both Vendrick and Godfrey embody these qualities, feel free to let me know if I've missed anything. To add greater weight to these ideas, Miyazaki has also stated in a previous interview that Godfrey shares a deep connection with the Tarnished since he himself is Tarnished. That frame of thinking between with strength being something that both players and these legendary rulers share is what makes this theme in particular in Elden Ring and Dark Souls 2 so interesting. The idea that we can essentially become them in many aspects by way of our own deeds and those deeds alone is why this theme is so important and so interesting to discuss. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. I appreciate you taking the time to check out this video and the channel, as well as sharing your thoughts in the comments below. Take care, and I hope to see you again in the next one. Brave, tarnished, thy strength befits a crown.